I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is the uh, wonderful Mary Atwood, who is a great friend of mine. Um, and um, Mary is um, chairman of the Arts Society Victoria. Um, Mary also has um, been very involved with uh, yoga, with, um, with, with art history, and has been working um, alongside a, a wonderful um, color symbolist, a medievalist, um, and uh, sort of this wonderful course that um, has partly inspired this meet today um, called Myth, cosmology, yeah, and it's a master's degree with Angela Voss, who very sadly um, is not well at the moment, but she had hoped to come today and discuss um, more deeply about colour symbolism. Um, so thank you very much, Mary. For your um, so just to begin, I, I just want to take a slightly different angle on this um, and talk about colour as, as best I can. I'm not a, an absolute colour theorist, but really within the context of our modes of seeing, our modes of perception, and what that means. Because if you just look at something on a literal level, you know, we might see colour, but the colours will have a different resonance within us. So it's really about bringing you, as the observer, back to how we're actually perceiving and responding to art and that which we see. So it's quite specific. And to set that into a broader context of the Renaissance and the mode of the imagination, what that actually meant in the Renaissance, and somehow bridge that with what we would consider an older, perhaps outmoded idea of um, something that happened a long time in the past, but really to find those aspects in the Renaissance in how they perceived um, images and try to find some links today with modern neuroscience, psychology, and um, our modes of seeing and perception, really. So I've, so I've called this the colors of the heavens and the earth in the Renaissance imagination and Carl Jung's psychology of alchemy. So in, in essence, the Renaissance, as the title suggests, is pulling in color from what they perceived were the colors of the heavens and also looking at the earth and the world around them. So it's a real drawing together and in between that is the imagination. So I'm just starting with this image not to particularly analyze it. Does anybody know this image? Seen it before? Artist? Not that it's a test. Fra Angelico, Annunciation. Now this has been spoken of Quite a lot recently, um, if anybody's familiar with Dr. Ian McGilchrist's work, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, a phenomenal book, um, and he talks a fair bit about this image as being a sort of metaphor in a way, and I'd like to present it in the same way to you. So I will be talking about metaphor and the symbolic rather as things just in a, li a literal sense. Um, so really having this image as um, a metaphor really for our approach to seeing, a sort of a waiting on, a listening in, a holding of a space between something to sort of move us into that different mode of seeing and perception. It's a sort of a leaning in towards something, perhaps, that we might have forgotten. And to situate ourselves back into the Renaissance, probably many of you are familiar with Leonardo da Vinci's quote, which has been quoted many times, but he said, an average human looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, eats without tasting, moves without physical awareness, inhales without awareness of odor or fragrance, and talks without thinking. That so actually kind of rings a few bells today, I think, as well. It's something that we can all relate to and see in the world around us still. And I suppose, you know, some of the sort of mindfulness people say, well, actually, he's talking about mindfulness, you know, not being present, not being in the present moment. Well, he is, but he's actually talking about something a lot deeper than mindfulness as well, in the, the full extent of the senses, sense perception, and that these were sort of portals, really, to a deeper knowing. I think we understand the senses today in a very, in a very mechanical way, and they do have that function as well but they are also something which takes us into deeper layers within ourselves, and that responds to the sort of multiplicity 
and layers that we see and perceive within art and images. <clears throat> At the Rena in the Renaissance as well, the eye was seen as or considered to be the primary sense because the eye was the window to the soul. And I'll talk a little bit more about what soul might mean because it's probably not how we really understand it today either. Leon Battista Alberti, who wrote um, his treatise on painting, Leonardo sort of followed his, his um, idea as well. But it's interesting that they both talk about black and white, obviously, as, as Roy has, and so did um, is it Tom in the beginning. Obviously, these are the sort of two extremes. But Alberti said, I would have artists be convinced that the supreme skill and art in painting consists in knowing how to use black and white because it is light and shade that make objects appear in relief. So in the Renaissance, this was fundamental because images were seen as something which was not inanimate and a dead object as we might analyze works of art today, but they were seen as something which was alive, animate, infused with soul, the anima mundi, which was believed to be permeating through the whole of the cosmos at this time, was something that was coming through the images, if the images were fashioned in the right way. So light and shade become obviously the key to this in creating this illusion of three-dimensionality on a two-dimensional surface. So this becomes a fundamental part of the Renaissance theory in the, very, in the Quattrocento. Key to all art, really, that flourished from there was the skill of draftsmanship, because the production of paper was um, flourishing, as was the skill of the artist to be able to draw first. And this was absolutely key, absolutely fundamental to the process of drawing. So on the left here, we've got um, a study by Ghiberti trying to capture the movement. This is for a study for the flagellation, a very different sort of drawing to the one on the left. Any guesses who that might be by? Leonardo, again. <laughs> Leonardo da Vinci, and a study of the hands. So you can see that even just through their drawings, they're already thinking, they're thinking in light and dark and the shading in order to get this sense of volume of form and as I mentioned, the eye was seen as the window to the soul. So the soul in Renaissance wasn't something, as we might believe it is today, as something that just sits within our heads or an idea about something we might have when we die. Um, soul, because you have a lot of the Platonic and Aristotelian texts coming through at this time, but primarily Platonic as well, which was a huge influence, um, the soul was seen as something which was in us and outside us as well, and not something that only belongs to you. So soul was in the whole cosmos, as it was. So having the powers of observation as an artist was absolutely key to their process in this time of being able to execute images which revealed the soul through the form, and that by the person looking at these images, your soul was also supposed to be moved to correct action or in a tropological sense, which means to turn, where your soul turns to see itself and may realize what you should or shouldn't do and change your course of action. One biographer um, of Leonardo's says that, uh, he's a current biographer actually, Charles Nicholl, who studied him in depth, and he said that Leonardo had the alert and open receptivity to the world around him, an almost explicitly childlike state, which allowed him to see into the heart of things. And the powers of observation is absolutely key to this. So looking to nature, which was seen as maestra, nature was mistress, nature was at the top, not man. So having this power of observation to really see into nature, having an almost what you call a sort of a double vision, a holding of a double vision. Because the advent of scientism hadn't come in at this point, the world of phenomena was fascinating. And Leonardo, as we know from his sketchbooks, was fascinated with the world of phenomena. How does it work? What's making the wind move? How does water move? What's making all these things happen? Because they didn't have the explanations or the empirical evidence that we have today. Um, 
but there's something in that sense of the mystery that was retained in the Renaissance, which was, which was so sort of infused, really, in all of their work. So the holding of a double vision was being able to see what's before you and appreciate the beauty of nature around you, and similarly in a work of art, which had to reflect nature with a capital N, and at the same time as an indicator of something beyond it. And that was very important, that second bit, and it's often a, a leap that we don't really do today. We, we take things, what we call it, I suppose, a literal, literal state, a literal um, face value, and we don't really move beneath the layers of, well, what might it mean to me? So this was absolutely key in the Renaissance. <clears throat> Soul, incidentally, also literally means psyche, from the Greek word psyche. And psyche, again, is another word which is, is, is heavily misunderstood today. We think psyche is just our own brain churning around, but actually psyche, again, was seen as something which was out there and in here at the same time. So you've constantly got this sense of inner and outer. One isn't substituted for the other at all. So they can both coexist next to each other. Now, Leonardo did write in his, um, on painting, uh, in his book on painting, and he is describing, this isn't only just coming from him, but he's describing the colors to a certain extent. So he's saying white is given by light, yellow is given by earth, green is given by water, blue is given by air, red is given by fire, and black is given by darkness. So it's quite interesting as well. He's got the white and the dark on both sides, which I'll talk about a little bit in a moment when we look at a couple of, of works of art. Um, these also relate to the four humors, which I think Roy mentioned very briefly. Um, and the colors don't necessarily translate exactly into that, but the four humors were also seen as something which um, shaped somebody's personality as well. So there's a sort of correlation there. There's the four humors with the four elements. So Leonardo's describing the four elements there through the colors, earth, water, air, fire. Um, incidentally, this is very similar to the Vedic system as well um, in the um, Hindu cosmology. And also, it's very similar to um, they have fair, air, fire, earth, water, and ether. Now, ether is missing from this, but actually, there was something which the um, Platonists especially believe was called spiritus, which was the sort of fine, subtle substance which was infused in and around the anima mundi, and it's something you could literally breathe in and um, call down into an image when an artist was, was making an image. <clears throat> um, so Marsilio Ficino, who um, Roy mentioned as well, was talks here in his book about the colors of the world, and he does talk about lots of other colors as well, but he talks about three colors in particular, which are very powerful. And the reason for this is that an image, the way an image was fashioned, was supposed to be a coming down of the cosmos, as it was, into a physical form, and a drawing up of the Earth, Earth's elements, into the form at the same time. So you've got the celestial, the heavenly, and the earthly coming together, and the place that, where they meet is the image or the imagination as well, caused by the imagination. And Ficino said, there are colors of the world at once universal and particular. The doctors judge it useful to look at these particular colors above all in order to capture the gifts of the celestial graces. So he said green is the color of Venus and also of the moon, moist for moist complexions, and that relates to the um, humors as well. Gold or yellow, the color of the sun. Sapphire blue, the color of Jupiter. He said the lapis lazuli possesses the ability to cure black bile, which was a, a, a cause of um, melancholy. But melancholy wasn't a no-no, actually, in the Renaissance. It was actually something that was revered. But it was to have too much melancholy meant that you were sort of Im immovable, you were immobile, you didn't really do much with it, um, and which comes from Saturn. Lapis lazuli comes into being along with gold, 
and is decorated with golden marks. So he's saying lapis lazuli has got little gold specks in it. Thus, it is the companion of gold as Jupiter is of the sun. And it's interesting that when we look at, and Leonardo wasn't necessarily a, a huge follower of, of Plato either. I mean, we can almost say he was sort of more Aristotelian, really, in his approach that, of looking at, at the world. But when we look at Leonardo's images, he does err on the side of the sort of slightly darker tones, the more sort of ethereal, there's a sense of a mystery in the dark caves that um, Mary, the Virgin, is situated in. Has everybody seen this painting before? Yeah? Yeah. So it's the Virgin of the Rocks. It's the National Gallery's version. But in this, there's a real coming together of those, the black and the white. You know, she's illumined almost. He used to actually look at the moon and the, the shadows on the moon in order to be able to paint female faces. Um, they're also illuminated so that the, where they would have been in the original situation in the church, but in the altarpiece, would have been lit by the light, the candlelight. Um, so we have this sort of sense of the ethereal, really, this sort of mystery, this sort of darkness, that something's kind of evolving out of this darkness. He's got his wonderful blue for the Virgin, and it's really showing all the elements in one snapshot. It's showing the microcosm of the macrocosm, which is the greater, the greater universe. Any comments on this? Are we sure the flesh stones are on our show now? Or are they like obviously, yeah, they are obviously not that bright, but they're, they're pretty illuminated. I mean, I've taken photographs of it with my own camera. But have some of the pigments disappeared? Or Maybe some, were, but, but the... There originally mm, this has been restored um, to as close as they can possibly get to its original thing, but the overall is that there is, a, there is a contrast between light and dark, and it's done in a very subtle way. And his sense of what he used, fumato, this sort of gentle movement from light to dark without a sort of hard edge, um, holds it in a sense, that, that sort of sense of mystery, of what we can see and what we can't see, you know, the known and the unknown, the ethereal, something sort of emerging from the darkness. And caves as well, incidentally, it's, it's quite interesting that... Um, She's in a place that almost is sort of familiar but unfamiliar at the same time. But caves were considered to be receptacles in the earth, real caves, receptacles in the earth where um, sort of cosmic forces would gather. And that was Pharacades, who was Pythagoras' teacher, who originally said that. So caves feature a lot in these, in these images. So you have a sense, really, that the earth, the earthly, the human, is being pulled into this image at the same time as the cosmos is being drawn down into it. So in order for that to happen, the mediator for the images really has to be the imagination, but the visionary imagination, not the imagination as we might know it today, which can be um, untrained, so, so you could say, you know, it's just sort of mulling over and over and over something, but lots of philosophers from thousands of years ago, as have psychologists and various other people spoken about something called a visionary imagination. Dr. Kathleen Rain, the Blake scholar, also speaks about it. Um, William Blake, similarly, and Carl Jung also spoke about the active imagination. So very similar things. So the image was, is seen as a sort of coming together of the earthly, the celestial, and the heavenly. And the imagination is the intermediate realm between the heavens and the earth, but it's a place both inside and outside. So the artist would ideally draw in their sense of fantasia, that's their imagination, bringing together intelletto, that doesn't just mean intellect in the very, very narrow way that we understand it today either, intellect meant something much broader, which included sense perceptions as well, um, and drawing these all together to create um, an image onto onto the um, canvas. And there's also a sense that in looking at images, the soul can employ different modes of knowing, not just one. So the soul in the viewer will respond to the level at which 
the soul is seeing the soul in the image. So you might see, if you see things at a literal level, then that's all you'll see. It's just a painting of a house. If you see things, though, and there were four levels to this. It's called the four senses hermeneutic, which is an ancient um, neoplatonic way of interpreting images um, through the Judaic, Arabic, and Christian traditions. And it's a fusion of all this sort of coming together. So the first level was called the literal level. And I think most of us can agree that most of our world operates on a fairly literal level, especially when it comes to art and things are sort of dissected and prodded at as if they're just objects to be analyzed. Um, the second one is the allegorical level, which is an allegory of something. So it's a, like a simile, it's telling the story, but in a different way. And that helps to open up our minds in a sort of broader way, if you like, a sort of running along a sort of horizontal level, like the, the hor horizontal line of a cross. But then the third level in seeing, or the third level that your soul could employ was called the tropological. And that comes from the Greek word tropos, which means to turn. And that's the moment when the soul turns to see itself, so that's talking about the world soul and the human soul that are sort of correlating. It's where the, the human soul remembers that actually they are a part of a world soul as well. They're not just individuals shut up inside their own skin. And they have a sort of a, a, an awakening. You can also liken it to you know theologians who've written about the dark night of the soul. Um, Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, used to talk about it in a sense that it was actually giving back your wings. Your wings would return and you could fly again. And then the fourth level would be the anagogical level, which is when you see the image before you as it's in its literal sense. You see its allegorical and the tropological all in one go. So you have the eyes of what Ficino would call the, the eyes of revelation, which see in all directions and which see all things all at once at the same time. You don't have to substitute one for the other. And that's this sense, I think, you, that we're not very used to, where you can hold lots of different possibilities all at the same time without one compromising the other. It's not either or. It can be both and. Um, in Carl Jung <clears throat> wrote quite a lot about something called active imagination as well. Um, which is almost a, a similar thing. So he speaks about getting into a mode when you're looking at an image or, or looking at nature to allow your rational mind to quieten down for a moment and let the rational mind subside. And only when you let the rational mind subside can the subconscious mind arise and you experience what he calls um, a sort of a cosmic flow. So you tap into a cosmic flow. It's something that's already there. And it's an active mode, so it's not nodding off in meditation. It, it's an active mode of engaging with images. And then the final stage, he said, at which he said is the most important, is returning from your experience and reflecting on it and making sure that you find out what that meaning has for you. He said, we have a moral and ethical obligation to understand the meaning in images. Very important. He said, without which we're impoverished and images just become something which is, is, is random and, and untethered. So um, that was, that's, that's his sort of mode of, of active imagination of how we can engage with um, a work of art, for instance. Now, neuroscientists have done lots of experiments with people with this, and they call it um, embodied cognition. And they've said that when they register what the brain's doing, when somebody actually imaginatively engages with an image, so you let the imagination go, you imagine yourself in the scene, you respond to it, you, f you know, images have a visceral effect on us. They're not, they're not just heady. You know, they happen in the body. We have, you know, our body responds to them. They're visceral. Um, that it has a very interesting effect on the brain, and it starts to recreate synapses that, between left and right hemispheres of the brain. Very, very powerful um, because it opens up different um, parts of creativity as well. So linking that briefly, how are we doing for time, Dee? What's the, we're, oh, okay. So we're linking that to, um, oh, it's okay, I can see, to alchemy. Not taking the whole lot and just putting it into the same frame, but just showing you another sort of mode of transformation, if you like, through our seeing of images and our responding to images. 
So alchemy, obviously everybody's heard the word, but it has a physical side, which is in its, that it's an ancient process of turning base metals into higher metals, so lead into gold. But fundamental to alchemy is its root belief that nature is an unfolding, dynamic process characterized by the work of transformation, and it works with both inner and outer. And this is really relevant to any process of creativity, including art. It's a sort of process of how you work with your materials, how you're responding to the materials. You know, we, don't, we just use things a lot today for our own utility. We have a very utilitarian sense about what can it do for me. But when you're working with art, when you're creating something, even if you're writing or whatever it might be, um, is to work, what's your relationship like with the thing you're working with? You know, what's your relationship like to your work, to, the, to your passion, and to work with that? That in itself is a form of, of an alchemical process as well. And also in how we see, see art is a form of alchemy. We move from surface to depth. Um, and Carl Jung also linked this, uh, he was very familiar with alchemy, and he linked it to the side of psychological process, if you like, um, of moving through the layers of our own soul, psyche, heart, our physical existence, and then how that might move us to act differently in the world. However, it sounds very linear, that it just sort of runs along a track, but we're trying to think of this process of something which is continually active and evolving, spiraling almost. So these were his levels of, um, that he linked to the alchemical process. So he said the first stage, because the first stage of alchemy, in essence, is the blackness of, and he said this is a state of confusion, chaos. You, you're sort of blind, you can't see anything, you don't really know what to do. Um, it's called negredo originally because it, it was actually referring to the black soil around the River Nile that used to flood every year and make it very fertile. So actually, the black state of confusion, depending on how you look at it, can be a very positive state because it's pregnant with the, the, the idea that something might transform, like a phoenix coming from the ashes. Um, the second stage was, so we've gone from black and now to light or white, um, was illumination. As we've seen as well, we can, you can apply a sort of alchemical sense to Leonardo's paintings too. The presence of light, white, this is albedo. And then the third stage, which he said is, is the learning stage. It's a sort of discovery. So, you know, the light goes on, you realize something, and then the third stage is you actually do something about it. So you learn, discover, um, and that's the transmutation, it's changing form, and that's the yellow color, Cintronitus. And then the fourth stage is transformation. That's the final stage. That's red rubedo, um, the color of the sun. So that w that's what Jung thought about the relation of alchemy, colors, and psychology. And similarly, with images, we can see those in the same way. So just looking finally at um, Leonardo Salvatore Mundi, which, um, well, despite the fact that it fetched so much money, um, again has this sense of the blackness, something emerging from the blackness, which we could view as a sort of form of alchemical process in itself. Um, there's a mystery there, you know, again, there's a sort of holding of, of the possibility, the holding of we can see something before us, but actually what's it indicating beyond it as well? and Christ with his hand in a blessing, holding the world in his hand, soul as sphere. Um, there was a lot of argument at the time when they were trying to um, find that, whether this was actually a real Leonardo or not. And somebody said, well, it wouldn't be a real Leonardo because he was fascinated by optics, um, which is why he created the technique called sfumata because he said the eye actually doesn't ever really see proper lines. It's always sort of moving. Um, and they said because he's painted that sphere without a sort of refraction of, of light that it can't be by him. But actually, um, it's representing the soul. So why, why would it have a, an actual physical form in that sense? So he plays with this sort of idea of, of what's known and what's unknown all the time. So I know it's quite difficult looking at, you know, sort of old art and then 
um, you know, sort of how does it relate to us now. But I, I, what I'm trying to sort of say is that I think we have to bring things into the present a little bit. Yes. Yes, it's in Dubai, I think, is it? Mm. Abu Dhabi. Yes, it has gone somewhere there. Um, and, and lots of people who looked at this, you know, this is the thing as well, we don't spend long with images. And for an image like this, lots of people just say, oh, you know, it's from another time, you know, it's religious, it has no relevance to us today, especially in our modern world, because we're so progressive. But that's not the point. The point is that if something speaks to you, if you like an, a work of art or an image, then it's actually, a, what happens is it becomes a process of you not only looking at it, but really seeing it. And it's something that Gombrich called the beholder's share. So it's not just beholding an image, but you being beheld by an image. So it's a two-way process. It's not just about us looking at something. It's how you're seen. Because images were seen as something which was perhaps wiser than us, something which can teach us something, because they come from a realm beyond, perhaps, that, that we can fully understand. Um, the final quote I want to give you is from um, Anthony Gormley, who I'm a big fan of, and I love his work in terms of his take on um, consciousness and you know wh what that means for us really, and especially in how we see art. And he also said, you know, he said I love. I love museums and galleries, he said, but we're really in danger of these places becoming catalogues of dead objects that are just stuffed away. And he said, what I'm interested in is how do we make things animate? How do we bring things alive again? You know, what's happened to our relationship to images as, as anyway? You know, Leonardo used to write that, you know, narrative painting, unless it moves the viewer in the same way as a protagonist in the image, its purpose is useless, you know. And I'm not saying we ditch the theory, because I use theory when I write as well, but I'm saying I think we need to bring back our responses to art to understand what does it mean for me as well, because there's, a, there's an impermanence in art. Art has something which is timeless, there's a timeless quality in it that we sense, but we can't always articulate it in words. Um, and images, too, don't come from the realm of, of the word. You know, images are almost beyond words. Jung said, um, image is the, the most direct ex and first immediate sense of who we are. It's our first sense of who we are. Aristotle said, soul never thinks without a mental picture. You know, these, there's something in images that they need to be valued and honored in and of themselves for and what they are. Um, and they speak to that part of the brain as well, which is intuitive, and it's capable of holding a number of different possibilities all at the same time. If you just let the rational brain step down just a little bit sometimes and experience. So Gormley says, um, it's easy to think of art as an add-on, but it's best to think of it the other way around, that it's the doing it, seeing it, participating in it, which makes us, we become fully ourselves. So thank you for listening. Has anyone got any questions?